Okay, this is Brian, and I am making a new type of annotated slide videos for class per student request, in which I go over some of the crucial concepts from each chapter. And the plan is I'll post these on the weekend before we treat this chapter in class, and I'll go over some of the key principles. So this is gonna be a subset of the slides, and I'm just gonna illustrate and explain some of the basic concepts. Not going to go over a lot of problems, just going to go over the basic concepts, the key physics. Now these are things that you can get from the chapter, but this is another way to present the information. And sometimes having a second perspective is useful. So look at these before you go to class, look at these after you go to class for review. Use them however you want, but the idea is to give you another set, another way to access the key concepts, the key principles for each chapter. So chapter 21 is about electric potential. In the slide that I'm going to have up at the start of each class identifies three crucial pieces we'll talk about with potentials. And that's this, electric fields are responsible for a new type of potential energy. And of course, electric potential is related to potential energy. So I want to look at an example here. I got this battery. I have a positive terminal on the battery. I have a negative terminal on the battery. And if you take a positive charge and you move it from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, it increases in potential energy energy. So the positive charges that pile up at the positive terminal here, and they will, will have higher potential energy. And we're going to talk next week about how to make circuits. I can take a wire and I can connect it from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, and the charges will basically roll downhill through the wire. They'll go through the wire and they're going to lose potential energy as they go, and that's how circuits work. But we have new type of potential energy that we are going to consider because we have electric fields uh, um, among our new ca our catalog of forces. And we're going to describe this potential energy in terms of electric potential. And I'll talk about what the difference is between potential and potential energy later. If you have charges that are arranged, they can store energy. So this camera flash here is run by a capacitor. And a capacitor is basically two plates. And on these two separated plates, I put opposite charges. I got positive charges on one. I got negative charges on the other. And there's energy in the separation of the charges because, of course, those positive charges would like very much to go around and be with the negative charges. And in fact, you can make them do that through an external circuit. If I connect a wire from one plate to the other, the charges will go from the positive plate to the negative plate. And as they do that, they're going to go downhill in potential energy. They will lose potential energy. Um, and you'll get other kinds of energy that are created. In this case, the energy of the camera flash. Now, another piece of the puzzle, and we'll start to talk about this in particular on Friday, is that muscle and nerve cells have large electric fields. You are an electrical organism, and that's going to be a theme that runs through the stuff we talk about for the next couple of weeks. This slide is about chapter 21's key equations and concepts, and I'll provide these at the beginning of the slides as I have been doing, and it's a good way to review. I'm not going to go over these in a lot of detail because we haven't talked about the concepts yet, but I do want to look at this basic one right here. And this slide is really, it's the crux of the biscuit for the whole chapter, basically. That's the relationship between electric potential energy and electric potential. And I'm going to write it in a different way, and this is the way it's introduced in the chapter. We say the difference in potential is equal to the difference in potential energy divided by charge. Okay, That's how you basically define electric potential. So if there's a difference in potential energy for charges, you can move a certain charge from one place to another. It moves in potential energy. We're going to identify the difference in potential between those two points using this relationship right here. And usually what happens is you have a difference in potential that's established by a power supply or some sort of source of something which can move charges. And we'll see examples of that. So this equation right here and this equation right here will be among the ones we use most commonly. So we'll go ahead and take a look at these. The others we'll talk about later. Now let's take a look at this situation. So I've got a flashlight battery here, and inside the flashlight it's hooked up to a wire, and the wire takes charges from the battery, they go through a light bulb, and then they come back and go to the other terminal of the battery. And then 
current is going to flow out one terminal of the battery through the light bulb and to the negative terminal. Now as the, char the current, which is the flow of charge, goes through the light bulb, light's coming out. Oh, so I have energy, radiant energy, being emitted by the bulb. Well, where did that energy come from? That energy was given to the bulb by the charges, and where did the charges get their energy? They get their energy inside the battery. Now let's focus our attention on what happens inside the battery. The battery's got two terminals. It's got a negative terminal and it's got a positive terminal. And inside the battery, charges are being raised from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And we always take as our default positive charges. So I can imagine little positive charges in here. They're being raised from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And as they do that, we can think of them as being raised uphill. That positive terminal is uphill from the negative terminal of the battery. And since I've raised them to a higher potential, I've raised them to a higher potential energy. Now the battery has, a, uh, has two different terminals and the difference in potential between the two is labeled on the side of the battery. It's 1.5 volts. The difference in potential between the two terminals of the battery is 1.5 volts. So the positive terminal is at a higher potential than the negative terminal. And when I raise charges from the negative terminal to the positive, I've raised them to a higher potential. And since I've raised them to a higher potential, I've raised them to a higher potential energy. And the relationship for this is the difference in potential energy is equal to Q times delta V. The amount of charge that's moved times the difference in potential. Well, the amount of charge that's moved in one second is 0.3 zero coulombs and the potential difference is 1.5 volts and so I end up with a difference in potential energy of the charges of 0 0.45 joules and that happens every second and so if I look at the power we have defined power is equal to the change in energy divided by a time interval well the change in energy of those charges is 0.45 joules and the amount of time that passes for that change to occur is one second and so I end up with 0 0.45 watts. So that's one half a watt and actually it turns out if it's an LED flashlight a half a watt flashlight is a really bright flashlight. So this is actually kind of a, a very very bright flashlight. So that's the type of thing we're going to be thinking about in this week as we're thinking about potential and we're thinking about charges and the motion of charges. So that's the type of thing we're going to consider, but let's look at more. Now let's talk about how to visualize potential because this is something we're going to do a lot of this week. And we're going to start by thinking about something you're probably familiar with and that's a topo map. Now on this topo map, I've got this line here, this is 4,500. That is a line of constant height. So if I follow this line, it is everywhere 4,500 feet above sea level. This is a line at 4,700 feet. These are lines of constant height. If you move along that line, you will have a line of constant potential energy because you're not going to be going up, you're not going to be going down. So we can think of these as lines of constant potential. We can think about them that way. Everywhere along those lines, you will have a constant potential because you won't be changing your gravitational potential as you move. And we can do something very similar for electric fields. So if I'm in a situation where I have electric fields, I can draw lines of constant electric potential. And these are these green dashed lines that we put here. These are lines of constant potential. And of course, they have to be perpendicular to the field lines because if I'm not moving up or down in electric potential, I can't be applying any forces. And so if I'm not applying any forces, I can't be moving with or against the electric field. So everywhere, the lines of constant potential are going to be perpendicular to the field lines. And the distance between the equal potential lines is going to be related to the strength of the fields. If the equal potential lines are close together, that tells me I have a really high electric field. If they're far apart, I have a weak electric field. And that's comparable to what you have seen on topo maps. If the equal potential lines, the lines of constant potential, the lines of constant height are very close together, that says the slope is very steep. Same thing with equal potential lines for electric, equal potential lines and electric fields. Now let's look at a practical example of this. Okay, here's a problem where we're asked to sketch the field lines 
in the eco-potential lens for a particular situation. Now in the lab, you're going to have a chance to do this experimentally. You're going to be measuring eco-potential lines with a voltmeter, and then you're going to use that to deduce field lines. But here, we're going to start with the field lines and then deduce eco-potential lines. And we know what the electric field looks like for this case. Okay, I have field lines that go from a positive charges to the negative charges and they're always in the direction of the force that would be felt by a positive charge and so I have field lines that go from the positive plate to the negative plate they begin and they end on charges the spacing of the field lines is uniform and so as a consequence the electric field is uniform everywhere between the plates and if I was to draw equipotential lines lines of constant electric potential the equipotential lines are perpendicular to the field lines. We know that that's true. And let's think about how we space them, okay? We're going to space them so that they are evenly spaced because the spacing between the equipotential lines tells us the strength of the field. And we know that the strength of the field between the two plates is uniform. So I better have evenly spaced equipotential lines. And the equipotential lines are lines of constant potential. And in the lab, you're going to establish the potential by hooking up these plates to a power supply, which is going to have difference, different potential to try to apply to the two plates. You're going to hook it up to a 12 volt power supply. So the top plate will have a potential of 12 volts. The bottom plate um, will have a potential of zero volts. That's typically our convention. We just set the lowest potential being at zero. And then the Potentials in between are just going to be evenly spaced. I'm going to have one here at 2 volts and one here at 4 volts, one at 6 volts, one at 8 volts, one at 10 volts, and one at 12 volts. And you can see as I'm going from line to line, each time I go a certain distance, I'm going up by a certain amount in potential until I go to that plate. And so if I think about a gravitational an analogy for this, I'm just going uphill at a steady rate. It's a constant field. I'm just kind of like steadily going higher and higher in potential until I get to the top plate. So it's kind of an abstract notion, but um, we're going to give you a chance to experience it in the laboratory and it'll start to make a little bit more sense for you there. Okay. Now let's take a look at another kind of conceptual example we're going to look at in class. So in this one, we're told we got we have uh, each part of the figure, so A, B, C, and D. We have three points in the vicinity of two point charges, and we're supposed to rank the potential at point one and point two and point three. Now remember, there's a relationship between potential, change in potential, and change in potential energy. It looks like this. So if I go to a higher potential energy, I'm also going to a higher potential. So let's think about putting a positive charge at point one. And let's start with, let's start with case A right here. So suppose I put a positive charge here at point one. Okay. Put a positive charge at point one. I'm going to ask this question. If I were to take that charge and move it to point two, would I have to do work to make that happen? Would I have to push it or would it go all by itself? And if I have to push it, the charge has moved to a higher potential energy. And if it's moved to a higher potential energy, I have a higher potential. So if I'm going from point one to point two, I'm getting closer to this positive charge, but I'm the same distance from this one. I have to do work to make that happen. So I'm thinking point two is going to have a higher potential. On the other hand, if I went from point one to point three, okay, if we'll go from point one to point three, I'm basically, it's exactly the same. I'm close to one charge and I'm far from a second charge. That's exactly the same thing that was true at point one. I'm close to one charge and I'm farther from a second charge. So really, it's, it's kind of symmetrical. So I'm thinking for this one, I'm going to say this, V2 is greater than V1, which is equal to V3. I think that's what I'll say for that one. Now let's take a look at case C. I'm sorry, let's take a look at case B. So in case B, I've got point 0.1, point 0.2, and point 0.3. If I take a small positive charge and I move it from point 0.1 to point 0.2, it's the same distance from the positive charge, okay, which 
so nothing's going to change. But it got closer to this negative charge. It was all the way over here. Now it's much closer to that negative charge. And positive charges like to be close to negative charges. And so the charge would do that of its own volition. It's going to a lower potential energy. Um, and so that point is going to have a lower potential. And if I go from point 0.1 all the way over to point 0.3, I've gotten a lot farther away from the positive charge, and I've gotten closer to the negative charge. That's a positive change too. And actually going from point two to point three, I've gone farther away from the positive charge, same distance from the negative charge. That is gonna be at a lower potential. So the potentials of point one and point two and point three in this case are gonna be V1 is greater than V2 is greater than V3. That's gonna be my relationship of the potentials. And the other ones we will do in class. Now, if we have expressions for electric field, we can also write down expressions for the potential. And we have an expression for the electric field near a charge Q. The electric field is equal to K times Q divided by R squared. So we can write an expression for the potential near a point charge. And if we assume that the potential at a great distance is equal to zero, and that's one of our conventions, so way out here at infinity, the potential is equal to zero. Near a point charge, Q at a distance R, the potential is equal to K times Q divided by R. That's the potential at a distance R from a point charge Q. And you have a similar expression around a sphere, but the thing we're going to be interested in is this. If you have a sphere and you're looking at the charge, at the potential right at the surface, so you have a sphere that's charged. The potential right at the surface is just K times Q divided by R, but where R is equal to the radius of the sphere, and so the potential right at the surface of a sphere is just equal to K times Q divided by R, where R is the radius of the sphere. And we will use that to do some problems. For instance, we're going to calculate the voltage of a hummingbird. And what does that mean? Well, the bird picks up a certain charge, and so as a consequence, we can, def we can treat it like a point charge. It's got a certain potential, and that's relative to the potential zero at a great distance. What is the voltage of a hummingbird as it flies through the air? That is a problem that we will solve in class. Now, I want to think about the dipole field, because that's going to be a really, really, really important one for us. And here's the question. What is the potential difference between point A and point B? And we'll talk about this in class, but remember the way we do it is we imagine moving a charge from one point to another. Well, suppose I move a charge from here to here. I am everywhere moving perpendicular to the field lines. As a matter of fact, that line that I've just drawn right there is an equal potential line. This is an equal potential line because it is everywhere perpendicular to the field line. So what that tells me is that A and B are at the same potential. The potential difference between the two is equal to zero. And that's going to be important for talking about the electric field of the heart. Now I want to take a look at this unit, and this is a very, very special unit, and it's called the electron volt. And the name is stupid. It is a dumb unit. Um, but one electron volt, one EV, little e, big V, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And I'll show you why. Suppose I took an electron, so I have an electron here, and then of course the charge on an electron, we know what that is, Q is equal to E. And let's just look at the magnitude of the charge. That's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So if I took a, an electron and I moved it through a potential difference of 1 volt, the change in energy would be equal to Q times delta V. Q is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, delta V is 1 volt, and so the poten change in potential energy would be equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules, or it would be equal to 1 electron volt. And that makes a lot of calculations very, very easy, okay? And this is the kind of thing, that if you just start using it, it's just going to start making sense to you, okay? You can, you can start to get accustomed to it. And we'll show you some examples. 
Let's take a look at the kind of problems that we're going to be able to solve using these electron volt units. So I want to talk about this situation. If you take a wire, a beer wire, in a vacuum and you pass a current through it, you warm it up and electrons get emitted from it. So I'm going to have a free electron right here and I'm going to hold the potential of this wire at zero volts. Over here I have a plate which is held at a potential of 150 volts. So there's going to be field lines from the 150 volt plate to the zero volt wire and the field points from high potential to low potential. The electron will feel a force opposite the field because it's negatively charged and so the electron will speed up. What will be its final kinetic energy? Well we can treat this using our basic law of conservation of energy. As the electron moves, its potential energy is going to change. And its kinetic energy is going to change as well. And we know the magnitudes of these two quantities are just going to be equal. We know that that's true. It's going to lose a certain amount of potential energy. It will gain an equal amount of kinetic energy. Now the amount of potential energy that it loses is just equal to Q times delta V. Well, the charge on the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And the difference in potential is positive 150 volts because it goes from 0 to 150 volts. And so I end up with a change in potential energy of 2.4 times 10 to the negative, 19, negative 17th joules. That's the change in potential energy. So what is its kinetic energy when it gets there? Oh, by the way, and that's a negative change. So it loses that much potential energy. So what is its change in kinetic energy? It's just equal to positive that. And so the final kinetic energy is just equal to 2.4 times 10 to negative 17th joules. Here's the thing. If I convert that to electron volts, that's just 150 electron volts. Oh, so if I have an electron that went through a potential difference of 150 volts, it gains a kinetic energy of 150 electron volts. Well, that's easier. No equations, no calculations. You can just evolve that out of your consciousness. And I want you to solve problems that way. So if I ask you this problem, I don't want you to go through all those calculations. I just want you to say, look, an electron went through a potential difference of 150 volts. As it did that, it gained an energy of 150 electron volts. So think about if it gains kinetic energy or it loses kinetic energy and just use that electron volt unit to your advantage and you can just see, yeah, the final kinetic energy of electron is 150 electron volts. And I'll show you some calculations where that will also be useful. Now let's consider this situation. I'm going to consider the situation of what of calculating ionization energies. And you know what it means to ionize something. If you take a charge off of an atom, you've ionized it. If you put a charge on it, you've ionized it. We're going to consider taking electrons off it. So suppose I took an atom and I'm going to remove a charge from it. How much energy will it cause me, cost me to do that? Well, imagine I took this atom and we're imagining it's spherical. And I just imagine taking an electron and just separating it. So I have a negative electron and it's at the surface of a positively charged ion core. And then subsequently I have to take that electron and I have to remove it to a great distance. Well, we can say this electron is basically sitting at the surface of a sphere and I know how to calculate the potential at the surface of a sphere. It's K times Q divided by R, where R is the radius of the sphere, I can compute the potential at that point. Okay? And if I compute the potential at that point, I can calculate how much energy it's going to take to extricate the electron. And the easiest way to do that is to use electron volts. So for instance, if you calculated that the potential at this point right here was 10 volts, and it'll be a positive potential because it's a positive charge, how much energy is it going to take to extricate the electron? You guessed it. It's going to be 10 electron volts. And you can, you, you, you can also use relationships, and there's examples in the book that are described that way, but I find it much more intuitive and much more straightforward to just use calculated potential. Think about the energy. I'm going to have to do work to extricate that electron. I'm moving it through a potential difference of 10 volts. That's going to cost me an energy of 10 electron volts. 
Now we're also going to talk about capacitors in this chapter. And capacitors is basically any two separated conductors that have you can you can put charges on. And when you put charges on them, there will be a difference in potential between the two. Okay? And I'll show you an example. And storm clouds are basically capacitors that have got separated charges that have a potential difference between them, and we can think of them that way. So here's a typical situation. At the bottom of a storm cloud, I have this charge center, which is holding at negative 25 coulombs of charge, and there's an equivalent charge collected in the ground below of positive 25 coulombs. So I've got two separated charges. There's a potential difference between them, and we're given the potential difference. That's a typical value. It's it works like a capacitor. I have stored energy in the separation of the charges. And when a lightning bolt flies, you're basically releasing that energy that is stored in the capacitor. Okay. Now, let's think about the questions here in turn. And I want to take a look at this first one. What is the approximate electric field between the charge center and the ground? Last week, when I talked about electric field, we said the units of electric field are newtons per coulomb but i said we'll have another unit that we can use and it relates to potential because if you're going to compute the potential difference between two separated uh, between two points in space the difference in potential is the electric field times the distance between those two points oh and so i can say the electric field is just equal to the difference in potential divided by the distance and so the units of electric field are also going to be volts per meter and how do i calculate the approximate electric field between the charge center and the ground well i know the difference in potential and i know the distance and so i can just compute the electric field and we expect it to be a big electric field Next up, what is the approximate capacitance of the system? Well, we have a basic relationship for capacitance that says the charge stored on capacitor is equal to C times delta V. Now, here's a convention that you need to be aware of. There's negative 25 coulombs here. There's positive 25 coulombs here. So the net charge is zero. But in this relationship, I just consider the charge on one plate. So what I'll choose here is just 25 coulombs. The magnitude of the charge on one plate. And then this is the potential difference between the two plates, and so this is the capacitance. So for modeling a storm cloud as a capacitance, capacitor, we can compute the capacitance. And if we can compute it, uh, treat it as a capacitor, we can also figure out the energy stored in a capacitor. If we do that, if all the energy is discharged, we can figure out the power, and that is something we will do in class. Now the last thing we're going to get to in the week, and this is kind of awesome. Another thing that works like a capacitor is your cell membranes, because inside and the cells in your body have a difference in potential between the inside and the outside, and they actually have charges stored on the cell membrane. And those differences in potential and those separated charges are maintained by ion exchange pumps. And this is my simple model of the cell, and I'm just going to treat the sodium and the potassium channels. And I have sodium potassium exchange pumps, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into this in more detail in chapter 23. But I get a difference in potential between the inside and the outside of the cell. And so I have an electric field inside the cell membrane, and I can treat a cell membrane as a capacitor. It's two regions of charge separated by an insulator with the potential difference between the two, bam, this is a capacitor. And that is going to be really important for us in terms of analyzing conduction in neurons. And that's the last piece of the puzzle that we're going to get to in chapter 23. That's going to be our capstone topic for thinking about circuits, is we're going to do like basically myelinated axons as a circuits consisting of capacitors, which is the cell membrane, and resistors, which is like the salty fluids inside the axons. This is where we are ultimately headed. And those are the key concepts for the week. This is my annotated slide video for the week. And I want you to look at this before class and after class and review it. You can go back and take a look at these things later. And hopefully this is an aid in your studying. Thanks much, and I'll see you in class.